But anyways, um, hope everyone had a, a good Thanksgiving time, uh, time to reflect. And um, I know for the United States, of course, it's uh, the, on a Thursday here, I think fourth, fourth thir Thursday of, of the month of third. Okay. Uh, anyways, uh, uh, and I know our, or our cousins to the north in Canada, I think they celebrated in October. They have Thanksgiving Day and, and then some of our European uh, brethren also. And uh, so it's a, it is a time that uh, um, time to reflect, and especially for us, um, it is a, uh, a time when the seasons are coming to an end. It was a time to reflect back and as our harvest has concluded and what kind of a year it was and and um, the harvest season is always a special time of the year here in the northern hemisphere and we come to appreciate it come to appreciate the bountiful blessings of God and all that he has done for us and as I reflect back and we look back and um, you know, we, of course, grow corn, soybeans, and, and mint, and, and I look back, and it has been certainly another blessed year. Um, I know when we were harvesting, uh, started harvesting beans, I um, had to adjust my attitude a little bit, because I thought we probably had the best soybeans ever. And uh, we even had some neighbors saying, wow, those, those beans look great. I bet they're 80 bushel to the acre beans. And so, you know, you're, you're pumped and you're expecting we're going to, we're going to blow this one out of the park, hit this one out of the park. <laughs> and when we went into the field and we started combining and they were good, but they weren't as good as we had hoped. And, uh, and it wasn't no 80 bushel beans and kind of, like I said, was a little bit disappointed. And then I, I had to stop and say, whoa, back up. You know, I'm thankful for what we are given and uh, appreciate um, all of God's blessings. And, and um, not every year you're going to have the best crop ever. And uh, though corn, I will say. Our corn yields were excellent. Some of our better corn yields, that made up for it. And then uh, my son, who tends to the mint, um, did a great job this year as the mint yields were the best uh, record mint yields that we've ever had. So there's, there's a lot to be thankful for. But, you know, as I, again, as I reflected back, it's not only the crops um, that we harvested that I was thankful for. It was the fact that our family and our employees, which are our family also, they are a part of our bigger family. And I can look back and no one was injured. You know, there was no mishaps and everyone got through the year without issues. And for that, I'm probably more thankful than anything. Because as I go into the sermon, uh, you know, there's a story in there that um, that really hits home, you know, about how dangerous how dangerous agriculture is, and so when we can get through a year when no one is injured, no one has lost a finger, no one has been injured in any way, uh, we can be thankful. And we thank God for that protection. You know, as I also look back again, um, that we do live in one of the choicest areas of the world. That we can produce what we produce. We can help feed the world. We can help give to the world. Take care of our own people. And be able to help those nations that are less fortunate. In Psalms 24, I'd like to start there. 
I'd like to start in Psalms 24. I'll get there. I'm sorry here. Okay. <clears throat> So start in Psalms 24, start in verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, for he has founded it upon the seas, and he has established it upon the waters. So God is, this is all his. All the fullness and the goodness of the earth is God's. It is his. And we have the blessing and the gifts to be, or the gift from God to be able to, to, to till the ground, to have bountiful harvest, to be able to enjoy uh, this time of year. In Psalms 65, I'd like to go to Psalm 65. I want to start in verse 9. Psalm 65 and verse 9. You visit the earth and you water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide their grain, for so you have prepared it. I want to stop there for just one minute, because I don't know if you've seen on the news um, the drought in the Midwest and the Corn Belt and the Western grain states, the breadbaskets uh, of the United States. But when it says the river of God is full of water, our main river here in the Mississippi, as you've probably seen, has probably reached its lowest levels. And I just wanted to talk a minute about that. You know, the water in the Mississippi River has dropped so low that barges are getting stuck, leading to expensive dredging, and at least one recent traffic jam of more than 2,000 vessels were backed up. The Mississippi, the Mississippi River Basin produces nearly all 92% of U.S. agricultural exports and 78% of the global exports of feed grains and soybeans. The recent drought has dropped water levels to alarming low levels that are causing shipping delays and seeing the cost of alternative transport uh, rise, such as the rail, the railroads. In Vicksburg, western Mississippi, residents have seen less than an inch of rain since the start of September. That the river was lower, the mayor there um, said that the river was lower than he had seen in nearly 70 years. It is definitely having an impact on the local economy because the commercial use of the river has almost stopped. Last Friday, the U.S. Coast Guard, and this was not last Friday, this would have been in October, the U.S. Coast Guard said that there was a backup of more than 2,000 barges at various points. The halted barges were carrying recently harvested corn and soybeans. When the water gets low enough, com commerce starts to slow. Commerce is restricted, and it turns into a very uh, extremely difficult environment to operate. This will actually affect us in a very negative way, for we have to we have uh, uh, to have less cargo on our barges and less tonnage moving, and it affects our revenues. They cannot, because the river is so low, they cannot load the barges because then they would, of course, they, they'd be stuck because, you know, on the bottom of the river. So anyways, this is what is happening. We had a little rain, not much. The river has risen a little bit, but, but not much. We are still experiencing drought conditions, certainly in this, uh, in this part of, um, of the United States, which is affecting us, uh, if affecting the, the farmers wanting to move their grain, and uh, just overall commerce. A lot of fertilizer comes up the Mississippi River that uh, farmers use uh, each year. Um, in fact, it comes into... Um, uh, Chicago and other places on up into Wisconsin and and uh, all the other surrounding states that border certainly the Mississippi Mississippi River. 
Uh, I would like to continue in, in Psalms uh, 65 there. Again, um, the river, uh, in verse 9, the river of God is full of water. You provide their grain, for so you have prepared it. You know, you water its ridges abundantly. You settle its furrows. You make it soft with showers, and you bless its growth. You crown the year with your goodness, and your paths drip with abundance. They drop, uh, they drop on the pastures of the wilderness, and the little hills rejoice on every side. The pastures are clothed with flocks. The valleys are also covered with grain. They shout for joy. They also sing. What a description of you know, God's blessings um, on the agricultural part of, of our country. What a blessing it is to have those showers of rain. They have our rivers, well, not right now anyway, but I'm sure we'll get rain. We go through cycles. Uh, we'll, we'll see. But to be able to, again, uh, have the abundance in, uh, of all that we do, from pastures to cattle to livestock, you know, it is a truly a, a time to reflection and being uh, or having thanks and giving thanks to God. Title of my sermon today is Characteristics of a Thankful Heart. That's what I want to talk about because we take for granted so much of what we have in America. If we're hungry, we go to a restaurant, we go to a store, and we just expect it to be there. It's always been there, right? And so we expect it to be there. Someday, that probably will change, as we are told in prophecy. I wanted to read about the first uh, Thanksgiving uh, here in America. It was actually settle, uh, celebrated, a harvest celebration. It was held by the pilgrims of uh, the Plymouth Colony in the 17th century. The first uh, account uh, that we know of is William Bradford's journal titled of, uh, Plymouth Plantation, of Plymouth Plantation, and the other is a publication written by Edward Winslow titled Mort's Relations. that talks about the first uh, Thanksgiving. What is known is that pilgrims held the, the first Thanksgiving feast to celebrate the successful fall harvest. Celebrating a fall harvest was an English tradition at the time, and the pilgrims had much to celebrate. The 53 pilgrims at the first Thanksgiving were the only colonists who survived the long journey on the Mayflower uh, and the first winter in the New World. Disease and starvation struck down half of the original 102 colonists. What I find fascinating about this is not only did they want to give thanks to God for the blessings, um, uh, first of all, probably coming to uh, the new world, um, and then also, again, a, a bountiful a harvest but after losing nearly half of their family or the people that did come, they were still thankful. Even through those trying and difficult times, they still found something to be thankful for. And they thanked God for all that they had, even though there would be those who would not be able to be there to celebrate it with them. You know, these pilgrims made it through the first winter um, and the, uh, with the help of the local uh, Wam um, Wampanoag tribe, that was the Indian tribe, they had a hearty supply of food to sustain them, you know, through the next winter. So that, that was something that, um, again, we reflect on. People coming across, coming across to a new world and, and thanking God even though that there were those that would not make it through the first year. 
I wanted to uh, also read, um, I, I, I appreciated uh, Mr. Wolfert's uh, sermonette as he was going through it last uh, Sabbath. <laughs> um, I was cringing a little bit, and uh, but he didn't uh, take all that I wanted to talk about, a little, most, a lot of it, but <laughs> that I might repeat, but that's okay. But I, I just want to. It is so important to reflect back, because of where we're at today in our society. America is crumbling. We are being brought to our knees. We have forgotten. God, we don't want God in, involved in, in our lives, in our government, and we are crumbling and we are falling fast. And I want to reflect a little bit back on the thanksgiving, the characteristics of a thankful heart. I want to, October 3rd of 1863, a proclamation there by President uh, Abraham Lincoln. He said, the year that is drawing towards its close has been filled with the blessings of fruitful fields and healthful skies. To these bounties which are so constantly enjoyed that we are prone to forget the source from which they came. Others have been added which are of extraordinary a nature that they cannot fail to penetrate and soften even the heart which is habitually insensible to the ever watchful providence of Almighty God. In the midst of a civil war of unequaled magnitude and severity which has sometimes seemed to foreign states to invite and to provoke their aggression, peace has been preserved with all nations. Order has been maintained. The laws have been respected and obeyed, and harmony has prevailed everywhere except in the theater of military conflict, while that theater has been greatly contracted by the advancing armies and navies of the Union. Needful diversions of wealth and of strength from the fields of peaceful industry to the national defense have not arrested the plow, the shuttle, or the ship the axe has enlarged the borders of our settlements and the mines as well of iron and coal as of the precious metals have yielded even more abundantly than heretofore. Population has steadily increased, notwithstanding the waste that has been made in the camp, the siege, the battlefield, and the country, rejoicing in the consciousness of um, augmented strength and vigor is permitted to expect continuance of years with large increase of freedom. This was the optimistic view of President Abraham Lincoln. Even in times of, uh, times of war when we didn't know the outcome, if the Union would stay together or not. He goes on to say, no human counsel hath devised, nor hath any mortal hand worked out these great events. They are the gracious gifts of the Most High God, who while dealing with us in anger for our sins, hath nevertheless remembered mercy. It has seemed to me fit and proper that they should be solemnly, reverently, and gratefully acknowledged as with one heart and one voice by the whole American people. I therefore, I do therefore invite my fellow citizens in every part of the United States and also those who are at sea and those who are sojourning in foreign lands to set apart and observe the last Thursday of November next, uh, of, uh, Thursday of next November as a day of thanksgiving and praise to our benefit Father who dwelleth in the heavens. And I recommend to them that while offering up the ascriptions justly due to him, to God, for such singular deliverances and blessings, they do also with humble penance and our national um, perverseness and disobedience 
commend to his tender care all those who have become widows, orphans, mourners, or sufferers in the lamentable civil strife in which we are unavoidably engaged and fervently implore the interposition of the almighty hand to heal the wounds of the nation and to restore it as soon as may be consistent with the divine purposes to full enjoyment of peace, harmony, tranquility, and union. I know that was a bit long, <laughs> but there was a lot in there that Abraham Lincoln acknowledged. Acknowledging God, who is the one that is preserving our nation. He is the ones that have given us <laughs> the, the blessings that are unmeasurable. And he set this day as a part, as a national holiday, a day of thanksgiving to our creator, God. In Genesis chapter 49, Moses would tell of the befall of, of Israel of the tribes of Israel, I should say, in the last days. We go to 49, I'd like to start in verse 22. He said, Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by a well. His branches runneth over, uh, runneth over the wall. The archers have bitterly grieved him, shot at him, and hated him, but his bow remained in strength. And the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. We are strong. Our military is what it is because it's the mighty hand of God Almighty that makes it. He is, uh, from there is a shepherd, the stone of Israel. Verse 25. By the, the God of your father who will help you, and by the Almighty who will bless you with blessings of heaven above, Blessings of the deep that lies beneath. Blessings of the breast and of the womb. The blessings of your father have excelled the blessings of my ancestors to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him who was separate from his brothers. Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, would inherit those tremendous blessings. You know, we look at that and, you know, we look at Ephraim, uh, the British Commonwealth. Uh, we, we see our neighbors to the north in Canada, the vastness and the wealth of, of that country, of not only producing food, but natural resources that, that again, is unmeasurable. Uh, Australia, it's a continent in itself. One of the seven continents. It's, it's the smallest of the continent. But what a, what a gift that God gave to, to Ephraim. What a gift of the vastness of that country and, and its ability to produce food and the natural resources and the beauty and the wonders of that beautiful country also. Along with Great Britain, and our family members there in parts of Europe. The blessings that God gave are unmeasurable. Thornton Wilder said, we can quote, we can only, we can only be said to be alive in those moments when our hearts are conscious of our treasures. When we Understand, we acknowledge where those great things, those treasures come from. And God has made us alive. He has made us prosperous in all that we have. And we can be thankful to God for all that we have. The first point that I just covered <laughs> is a thankful heart. I have four points here. Uh, yeah, four points. A thankful heart recognizes the blessings of God. And 
as I just went through those, we do recognize, we, um, we thank God, we, we uh, are, lift up our voice with, with praise and, and honor to him for all those wonderful blessings. Psalms 23, you know, I, I love that psalm of, of David. He acknowledges God of, it's just of the wonderful gift that he had. The Lord is my shepherd in Psalms 23 and verse 1. He said, I shall not want. He makes me down to lie in green pastures. You know, he leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he said, I, I will fear no evil. You know, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. The blessings of God. Our cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall, shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the eternal forever. David's thankful heart to God for all the, the blessings that life could offer to him. And he acknowledged them, and he was very thankful for them. A second point uh, I'd like to talk about is a thankful heart is full of selflessness. A selfless heart is full of selflessness. You know, as we have these blessings, we just talked about the blessings here that God pours out on us. All of us have been blessed to even live here and to enjoy, to be a part of the prosperity that, that God has bestowed upon Israel, especially on the sons of Joseph. That it is a time, brethren, that our hearts should be full of selflessness. A heart that likes to help, likes to give. In Proverbs chapter 19, Proverbs chapter 19, and we'll go to verse 17. He who has pity on the poor lends to the eternal, and he will pay back what he has given. You know, God looks down upon our attitude. He looks down upon the blessings that have been given to us. Like I said, uh, during the harvest of soy, you know, our soybeans this fall, I had to stop. I had to back up. I had to say, whoa, time out. Adjust the attitude. Be thankful. Because as we talked to some other farmers, you know, they, there were some worse yields. Uh, it just wasn't a good bean, soybean year. And that's, it, and that's the way it happens sometimes. But at the end of the year, the end of the harvest, adding everything up, it was a good year for us. Maybe it wasn't up to our expectations, but that's okay. God provides it in other ways. And we're thankful for what we have, but we are to give to those or we are to help to the poor. God will bless it back to us. He will give back to us what we give to others. He will pay back what, um, what, he, what that individual has given. While we're in Proverbs, let's turn over to chapter 22 uh, and verse 9. Chapter 22, verse 9 of Proverbs. He who has a generous eye will be blessed, for he, gives, uh, for he gives of his bread to the poor. Again, God expecting us to watch out for the poor. Now, I know, and I'm going to go back to Leviticus 26 here real quick. Uh, excuse me. I think it's Leviticus 23. <laughs> um, Because it, it goes both ways. I, you know, it, we are to help the poor. 
uh, those who are in need of help. Um, I want to go to Leviticus chapter 23, uh, verse 22. He says, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field when you reap, nor shall you gather any gleaning from your uh, harvest. For you shall leave them for the poor, for the stranger, for I am the eternal your God. So we, again, that was something that God instituted. He said, there will always be poor among you. Leave the corners and, and don't glean the field. In other words, don't go out. Once you've harvested it once, it's now those who are less fortunate and poor that can come in and glean what was left and the corners. I remember my grandmother-in-law, she was a tough lady and she didn't, granny didn't have much. And I remember she'd bring her pickup out and she would glean our fields when we were harvesting corn. She had some sheep and a couple calves and, and but she'd get out there and she'd glean. I ran. I always ran the harvester, and I would always make sure if we had a little down corn that I'd lift the grain head up and leave it for Grant, you know, Granny to pick up. If she had the ambition enough to go out and to glean and and to help herself. I felt it was my duty to help too. But that's what God tells us that we should do, that we should be generous when we have the opportunity. Again, in Psalms 41, Psalms 41. We'll start in verse 1. Blessed is he who considers the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. The Lord will preserve him and will keep him alive. And he will be blessed on the earth. You will not deliver him to the wills of his enemy. The Lord will strengthen him on his bed of illness. You will sustain him on his sick bed. So, that individual that gives, again, and helps the poor, God is with him. God will sustain him. He will make sure that he will repay and there will be enough for that individual to pay his bills, to go on, and to farm another year. That is God's promise when he looks upon us and when he looks upon those that can help and do help the poor. In 1 John, I'm going to go back to 1 John chapter 3. Uh, 1 John chapter 3, I want to start in verse 11. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that a no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we by this we know uh, love by this we know love because he laid down his life for us and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Verse 17 but whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him how does the love of God abide in him? And it doesn't when we have when we have the goods that that sustain help with life sustain life 
help those that are less fortunate, whether it's our brother, physical brother, our spiritual brother, or neighbor. God said, don't shut up your heart. Because if you do, the love of God can't abide in you. Can't. Because God himself is a giver. He is the one that offers us and gives to us and sustains us in all that we have. I'd like to go to Luke 12 as an example. Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, I'll start in verse 15. And he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of things that he possesses. Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, You know, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he taught within, or, and he thought within himself, You know, what should I do since I have no room to store my crops. So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, drink, uh, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then, whose will those things be which you have provided? So, so is he who lays up treasure for, him, for himself and is not rich towards God. We can see in this parable that the rich man, his bins or his barns were apparently already full and another harvest was coming. And what was he going to to do. Ha, where am I going to put all of it? My bins are full. My barns are full. So I'll take down. I'll build bigger. No, this is the opportunity when you have blessings. Now, this is an opportunity to help those that are less fortunate, those that are poor, and those are, that are in need. And because he did not do that, because he was a selfish and a self-centered individual, only storing up for himself the gains that God gave him, that his life would be required of that night. It's a good example for us, brethren, that when we do have opportunity to serve, we do have opportunity to, again, give. That, that, that's what it's all about, life. You know, as Mr. Armstrong summed it up, you know, very, uh, uh, it, it's, it's very to the point, you know, a, a way of give. It's a way of give or a way of get. It's, it's a way of selflessness or it's a way of selfishness. It's one way or the other. And God wants us to be givers. He wants us to help. When those blessings come our way, that we are to help others that are left less fortunate. You know, it's not only giving, brethren, it's also uh, of physical things. It's also of time. It's also giving of a visit. I have a um, neighbor who lives about two, uh, about three miles from our main farm. And uh, her husband has been deceased for many years. Her and her husband actually were German immigrants after World War II. And they came through Canada and settled then in um, the U.S. and bought a little farm there by us. And um, they were of German descent. They had two, two boys, and they were about, one was a, little, a couple years older than me, and another one was younger. But, but uh, they were a part of the community. We knew them very well, interacted with them in 4-H and other activities. And since then, her children, you know, one has died, one moved away. She's there by herself. 
And I was going by her house one day, and I had been going by there because we have a farm right there next to hers. And, you know, I would toot my horn and wave. <laughs> and one day when she was outside, I, I said, that's, that's not good enough. I can't just toot my horn and wave. I stopped in to see how she was doing. She's in her upper 80s, very healthy. And uh, a good lady to talk to, a pleasant lady to, to talk to. And it just happened to be it was her birthday that day. And when I stopped in to visit with her, and um, being the good German lady that she was, she offered me a beer and to sit down and talk, talk with her. And I'm not much of a drinker, <laughs> but I had a beer <laughs> with, uh, I had a beer with her, and we sat down and talked and, and reminisced uh, some about the days gone by. But it is those situations we we have opportunity also to give to take the time to stop i know life you know what life is busy we'll never if you don't just do it you'll never do it because oh i gotta get here i got this to do i got you know i gotta be over at this farm or you know it, it's it's a dozen dozen excuses if we don't stop to do it we'll never do it and you're going to miss out. You're going to miss out on the face that is smiling, a face that is happy that you have stopped in to pay attention to him. Stopped in to visit. Stopped in to say hello. That's what, that's all we have to do. It's not much. Third point I had was a thankful heart. Uh, I was told not to put this down as one of the points, but I'm going to anyways. <laughs> a thankful heart endures trials. Yeah, someone said, I, I, don't, don't be thankful for trials. You know, trials, uh, those trials are tough. I won't, I won't tell you his name, but uh, anyways, <laughs> he, he works for us. <laughs> He's, he uh, led songs. <laughs> uh, but anyways, in all honesty, we can sit up, I can sit up here, and anybody can stand up here, I mean, and talk, and, and we can say, you know, talk about trials and say how good they are for us. Boy, I tell you though, what when trials hit and severe trials come, it's not as easily done as it is said. And that's why we need God. But we need, brethren, on all honesty, for us to grow, to develop the godly character. What is it? What if everything was given to us? What what have we learned? If there were no hard times and just, you know, hey, life was a breeze and we're out on the beach drinking a strawberry margarita in December somewhere and, you know, <laughs> what, what do we, what would we gain? What would we gain? We have to endure hard trials. I remember my dad was a, a man that did not like to spank. Because unfortunately, he came from a home where his dad didn't know how to spank. He only knew how to well the tar out of him. And my dad didn't want to be that kind of dad to his children. But there were times when I did get a spanking. I, I guess I provoked him enough that I get, did. And honestly, I look back. And I could have gotten a lot more than what I got. I recognize. I recognize my shortcomings. I recognize my smart mouth. Some of the things that came out of my mouth, he could have slapped me in the mouth if he wanted. But 
But we have to endure, you know, the trials. We have to go through trials to get where we want to be, and that is in God's kingdom. We've got to be tried and tested, you know, by God. He has to know where we're at. So let's turn to James 1. <laughs> and this one's for Mr. Ellertson. <laughs> James, James chapter 1, verse 2, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces uh, patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. See, brethren, that's what God wants us to have. He wants us. Our goal is perfection. That is what God wants, and we're, we're not there. I'm, I'm not there. I, I shouldn't say we're. I'm, I, maybe you are, but I'm not. And he wants us complete. He wants us complete in perfect, righteous character, holy character, lacking nothing. And we're not going to get there by being spoiled by everything just being handed to us. You don't appreciate the things in life when it's just handed to you. Fifty years ago, 1972 is when we started uh, what would be the Lawrence Brothers Farms. And my dad, um, I would be 12 years old, my middle brother 14, and my oldest brother 17. We worked after school and during the weekends to farm. My dad got us started, even though uh, dad owned, mom and dad owned the farmland. Not all, you know, dad uh, rented it out because he was the manager at the Farm Bureau Co-op, um, a farmer supply co-op. Uh, dad loved the farm, and so when we boys got old enough, he bought us an old set of equipment. <laughs> and I tell you what, 12 years old, I was in the height of my glory. I didn't care that that tractor didn't. Well, back then there weren't many cabs. Anyway, it was wide open. The roar of the engine, the heat of the engine coming back, the dust that just, I mean, you, it, it was unbelievable. And rough riding. Last couple years, I thought I wanted to, I don't know, I guess I got nostalgic and thought I'd want to buy a couple of those old tractors back. And, we, and I did for nostalgic purposes. And I get out on them, go down the road, drive them down the road, and, well, I tell you what, it's nice to park them back in the shed. <laughs> My son's back there laughing, but... But I didn't know any better. 50 years ago, that's all we had. And today, it's different. But how could I be thankful today for the wonderful tractors that we have today that has a heated seat in it? It drives itself. I was running one the other day. Mr. Ellerson got to run it almost all fall. It's got a massage seat in it. <laughs> Boy, yeah. And we got them paying to work for us. <laughs> No, but seriously, it, it, it's where we have come and gone, you know, where we were at and where we are today. How could I ever appreciate today without having those times that were harder 50 years ago? How can we appreciate things, brethren, if they're just handed to us? We can't. That's why, you know, James is saying, you know, <laughs> we're perfecting. We're, we're trying to reach, you know, God's kingdom. It's our goal to be a, wanting to be in God's kingdom. God wants us there, and he's making the way for us to be there. But he doesn't make it all easy. It's a tough path. It's a tough road that we go through, the trials and the tests. In 1 Peter, 
1 Peter chapter 4. First uh, Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with its exceeding joy. He says, you know, rejoice in the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings. <laughs> no one's beat me, you know, with a, a cat of nine tails or, you know, how Christ was beaten and mocked, spit on. I haven't gone through that. I don't think any of us have. What he's saying is, is the trials that come our way, we need to partake in them. We need to, to deal with them. It will sharpen us. It will make us a better person. Sometimes we don't see how at the moment. But in the end, it does. Those trials will make us a better people. Romans chapter 8. Uh, no, 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 I'm sorry. Uh, why we're in Peter. First Peter, chapter 1. First Peter, chapter 1. Uh, I'd like to start in verse 6. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various, you know, trials. That the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to, to praise, honor, and glorify at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So those various trials that we go through, they are more precious than gold. And we ought to be going through them. We ought to be delighted to go through them. I, again, I know we, we stand up here and we say that and when severe trials come. But that's when we, we buckle down. That's when we really get down you know, on our knees. Our relationship with God needs to expand, to be greater, to be better. We can make it through those things. Uh, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. First Corinthians chapter 10. Um, starting verse uh, verse one it says more more ever, uh, excuse me, more over, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that you know all of our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. You know, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food. They all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things uh, become our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted and do not become idolaters as were some of them as it is written the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play nor let us commit uh, sexual immor immorality as some of them did and in the one day 23,000 of them fell nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents nor complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed uh, by the destroyer now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition upon which the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. 
No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. So we are to look, look back, look back in history, look back at what people do. They are examples to us to know that we don't want to go there and do what they did. You know, sins, sins are, you know, there, there's no different probably in the sins today as there was back in time of Cain and Abel and all up through history. There's nothing new under the sun, honestly. But we, brethren, um, we have to understand that God is faithful, that he will deliver us out of everything that we are tempted by, and he will make the way escape, and he will help us to bear those trials that come our way. God is there. He is not putting things before us as stumbling blocks. He loves us. He wants us to see us to the end. He didn't call us for failure, but for success. He has called us to make it. Again, the trials and tests do help us. They help us to grow, to develop the righteous, godly character that we need to. I know that we, at in many times, <laughs> me, me, <laughs> um, I got to do it over again because I fail. But we'll get it right. We've got to get it right. And God is there to help us to get it right. You know, Abraham, as Mr. Fritz told, said last week in his sermon, 50 years God was with Abraham. And still, at the end of that 50 years, he still had to test Abraham by telling him he had to offer his son Isaac. And Abraham was ready to do it. The knife was there. I'm sure the knife was raised and it was ready to take Isaac's life. But as Mr. Fritz said, you know, now I know. Now I know that you will obey me. You know, that you will, you will uh, teach your children and you will obey me. I once read, you know, you can't have the rose without the thorn. Something so beautiful as the rose but yet there are the thorns there <laughs> that, you know, we can get pricked by it. You know, and it hurts. Those thorns hurt. You can't have the honey without the bee. You know, we know the bees can be dangerous, <laughs> the sting and everything, but we, we can't have that honey unless we have the bees. Nothing is going to be easy. Only when we're finally born into the God family, into the kingdom of God. But until that time, till that time, brethren, we can expect trials and tests. God has to test our heart. Deuteronomy, I think, 8, I won't turn there. When Israel, he said, I, I, I had to test you. I got to test you whether you will obey me or not. You know, we put the manna out. Six, he, he, you know, we talked to him, told him, you know, six days, seventh or the sixth day, you'll, you'll do double. Sure enough, out on the Sabbath, seventh day, there were those out looking for manna. Sometimes, sometimes that's me. Sometimes it can be us. And uh, God has to test our heart. Uh, the fourth point, um, a thankful heart, you know, has hope. We look at the world and um, we know that, <laughs> um, oh, it's in trouble. It's, it's not good. And again, especially our own nation, it saddens us, honestly. 
we look at the goodness of God and we look at the goodness of our nation and from sea to shining sea. We look at the prairies, the mountain, the purple mountain majesties and all the wonders. And we just see leaders destroying it. But we have hope. We have hope, brethren, because we know God has called us and we know what the outcome is going to be. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. For you see your calling, brethren. Do you, okay, did you catch that? For you see, you see your calling, okay? God has call, called us, not because we're anything special. I, like I said, you know, why us? Why me? You know, I, I don't know. But anyways, we're here, and God has called us. Otherwise, we wouldn't be. You see your calling, brethren, that not many wise, according to the flesh, not many mighty, there's not many noble, that are called. But we see that calling and we have that hope that God is offering to us in the future that he has shown us. And we have to be full of hope, to be full of appreciation for that calling and that we have that wonderful opportunity to be here and to be in his presence and, and his purpose that he has for us. In 1 first, uh, first Corinthians chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. First, first Corinthians chapter 12, uh, start in verse 12. For the, as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that body, of that one body being many, they are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Greeks or, or, uh, or Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, all have been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact the body is not one member but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body. It is therefore not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? He asks. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? And if the, and if the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he has pleased. God has called us. He has set us in the body of the church of God, the body of Christ. God has put us here. And he wants us to understand that, to see it, and to see the hope of our calling and the future that is ahead. Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. Okay, I'll get there. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 6, I'll start in verse 17. Thus God determined to show more abundantly to the heirs of the promise the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, that we have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. God's way of life, the hope that we have, is the anchor to who we are. It keeps us from drifting away. It keeps us steady and on track. 
It doesn't allow us to drift, that hope. And God said, grab a hold of it. It is an anchor. It is sure and steadfast. And that is our, our hope, you know, of, of that future and, and uh, knowing that Christ Jesus, our Lord, you know, is there before us and making that way. Uh, he is paving the path, as we know. Hera has paved the path, and we have to follow. But we have to lay hold of that hope. You know, I think... Uh, some people actually uh, <laughs> that we run or that we come in contact with in our life, um, they look at us and, and uh, they see our resolve. They see our belief. You know, I know I've, I've heard uh, things, uh, you know, with this Ukraine war um, about, well, you know, they, they talk about the world we're living in, our, the, the demise of our country. And these are just worldly people. But they, they, they see, they're, they're seeing something's wrong, of course. They say, well, maybe we won't be here anyways. Russia probably will attack us. And, and, uh, but it's, it's comforting to know that Russia's not going to attack us. It's, it's comforting to know the purpose and plan and prophecy, you know, that God has put in place, brethren. It is that that we can be thankful for. And that we have that hope. <clears throat> I've told the story before. Um, uh, I do want to tell, uh, tell it again. Uh, there are some that I, I think that are new enough that have never heard this. But uh, my brother Brian uh, was two years older than myself. And in 1991, on August the 4th, he lost his life in a farm accident. And... He was electrocuted to death on an irrigation system. It was a Sunday morning, and he had his daughters with him. They were both nine, uh, nine and 11. My wife and I's daughter, Erica, was with them. She was nine. But he went up to the irrigation system, and whoever installed it several years ago did not install the wiring correctly. <clears throat> and the wiring somehow got cut, and it was electrifying the irrigation system. And when my brother went up there to uh, adjust the, the, the percentage of water going on the field, it grabbed a hold of him, and he couldn't get away from it. It was 480 volts, and that's an instant death. He died that day, and we were the first one as <clears throat> the person that was trying to call and get a hold of my mom and dad and my brother, oldest brother. They couldn't. They got a hold of me and, and told me that, um, you know, Brian had been electrocuted, and they think that he, he is dead. And, you know, your, your heart, you know, just stops, um, uh, something that, you don't uh, understand. <clears throat> it's hard to comprehend, you know, and at that sudden thing. Anyways, uh, we went out to the farm where he was at, my wife and I. And uh, sure enough, the ambulance was out there and, and Brian was, uh, had lost his life. And my mom and dad uh, finally were contacted, but they didn't know that he had died. And uh, mom and dad came to the farm. I had to tell them. And, and of course, you can only imagine how it is when a parent lose, loses a son. But as we went through the funeral, and my parents were not all with it, of course. You know, we had to help, you know, make the funeral arrangement, arrangements for my brother. And I decided that I wanted the last words. I knew there would be a preacher there because, you know, I'm the only one in the church. You know, I was the only one called. I wanted the last words at the cemetery. I wanted the final say over his grave, over his funeral. 
I wanted the truth to be heard. And so I did. Everything, the funeral took place. I gave the final prayer or the last prayer there at the grave site before we lowered him in the grave. That night as we went to my dad's house, my mom and dad's house, and, you know, it's, it, it's like your parents are still in a state of shock. And, but my, my dad said, you know, Todd, if there's anybody that said anything today <clears throat> to comfort, to console, he said it was you and your prayer at the gravesite. And he appreciated it. And my oldest brother told my mom, he said, I wish, as he was devastated also, I wish I could have the faith that Todd has. Brethren, we have that hope that gives us the strength that we need during these trying and difficult times. As my brother died in August, it would be Thanksgiving, just three months later, three and a half months later, as my wife and I went to our parents' home for Thanksgiving, you know, my brother and his family would be there, my oldest brother, and, and uh, um, my dad uh, grabbed me by the arm and he led me back to my old bedroom. And with uh, tears in his eyes and a quivering voice, he said, Todd, would you please say a special prayer for Brian today during lunch, or during dinner, before dinner? Would you please say a special prayer for Brian? So I did. And it was a thing that it apparently affected my dad in a way and in a manner because honestly I was kind of the black sheep of the family because I God did call me into the church you know and I was kind of the outcast and you know because of our beliefs but yet when it was time of death time of sorrow for the family it was God's hope it was God's way of life that we know about that gave, I think, my dad a sense of comfort and a sense of hope. It would be a few months later that we would organize, reorganize the farm that my dad, um, as we sat there and talked, my oldest brother and myself and my dad, that my dad would pipe up and say, I don't want you to ever not believe what, you, what your religion is. He said, I want you to continue in your belief. And it was something that, <laughs> that really uh, struck home, really struck hard to me because they saw something there that the loss of a son that another son could offer them some peace and some hope and brethren we've got to be thankful for that hope and how ironic that it would be that I would be the only remaining survivor of the Lawrence men of my dad and brothers to to be here today and to be able to to farm the family farm to keep going to keep the farm going and that is because of the hope that we do have God says lay hold of it don't let go of it it is the anchor to our very being I ran across uh, 
in Mr. Armstrong's autobiography, and I kind of want to close with this story. Very touching story about Thanksgiving. In the second uh, edition, volume two of Mr. Armstrong's autobiography, on page 416, it, it starts. Mr. Armstrong says, I shall never forget, of course, how Dick came briskly running up the stairs to say goodbye. Well, Daddy said with a cheerful enthusiasm, I'm off on this trip. Richard David Armstrong was off on a trip, a baptizing tour, back in the day in 1958. Him and Mr. Alton Billingsley had left, and they were about 200 miles north of Pasadena, in between Los Angeles and San Francisco, would be the baptizing tour in which they were embarked upon. Mr. Armstrong receives a call. He said, Mr. Armstrong, he said in a voice, and this is Mr. Billingsley, He said in a voice that signaled even before his words that something was very wrong. He said, we've had a very terrible accident. And Dick, Arm and Dick, Mr. Armstrong's son, he is in very critical condition. Mr. Armstrong quickly asked for the facts, you know, where they were, you know, and, and everything so that they could make their way right away up there. And what had happened was they were in their car and they were on a highway and they didn't realize, they thought it was a, like, you know, like a four lane, four lane highway where two lanes are going in one direction to the other. And that's what they got mixed up. Mr. Billingsley was driving and they, he got mixed up on the road and he thought he was on a uh, double, you know, dual lane road, traffic going one way, and they weren't, and they came up over, came up on a hill, and they were passing this vehicle, and there was another vehicle right there, 150 feet away. They hit head on, they collided. Mr. Armstrong had to get up to the hospital because Dick had been unconscious and taken in an ambulance to a hospital there in San Luis uh, Abisso. Mr. Armstrong said, I had, uh, switchboard, I had our switchboard telephone operator call our uh, college physician, Dr. Ralph Merrill, Merrill, asking him to be ready as I would be driving past his office in Glendale on the way. I asked Mr. Norman Smith, our radio studio manager, to go with me. Dr. Merrill was ready as we drove past. I drove as fast as I dared, consistent with safety. When Mr. Armstrong, Mr. Smith, and Dr. Merrill got there, they found at the hospital, they found um, Richard David Armstrong he was now conscious, but in very critical condition. His right arm was broken at the elbow. His pelvis had been broken uh, badly, and they had him in traction. His jaw had been broken in three or four places. X-rays show that his heart had been knocked over to the right of the middle or slightly right of the middle of his chest. That's how hard the impact was. His left lung had been collapsed. Mr. Billingsley had been examined and released, not sufficiently injured to remain in the hospital. Dick Richard Armstrong wanted to rely on God for healing without medical aid. The doctors asked for a conference with Mr. Armstrong and Dr. Merrill. They explained that Dick was already in their care and to protect their reputation and that of uh, the hospital that they had to administer medical aid or else have him moved, in which case he probably would die before he would get home. Dr. Merrill, who himself had been healed by direct prayer and, un 
and understood both sides of the problem, advised us against moving him in his very critical condition. The hospital doctors agreed to give him the very minimum of medical aid consistent with their own and the hospital's protection. Then followed one of the most tense, strenuous weeks, the vigil of my life. I telephoned my wife and, with, and she with, Dix, uh, with Lois Dick's wife and their two and a half year month old son came to the hospital. Of course, Mr. Armstrong says, Mr. Smith and I had anointed and prayed for Dick immediately. It was a week of almost constant prayer. Mr. Armstrong, they needed three nurses there. So Mr. Armstrong, there were two nurses at the college. He had them come up and the hospital provided the other nurse for 24 hour observance of Dick Armstrong. The accident occurred on July 23rd of 1958. And by evening of July 29th, a various decision had to be made. Dick's kidneys were not functioning enough to keep him alive much longer. The doctors at the hospital there had called specialists from the UCLA Medical Center to come up for consultation. They told me that it would be necessary to attempt to remove, uh, uh, to move Dick to the medical center in Westwood, uh, Los Angeles, where they could use an artificial kidney to stimulate normal action by his own kidneys. And they thought that they could get Dick there without, before he died. They did get there to UCLA Medical Center. But during the week of all this agony, during the week of, of all the pain and the suffering, we had, Dick had various ones of us read the Bible to him. In spite of the pain and the terrible condition he kept in good spirits. Once in prayer, once in prayer, he began thanking God for the many, many blessings that had been lavished on him. The nurse in, the, in attendance said that this continued a long time. Through all that broken jaw, he was thanking God for all the tremendous blessings that had been lavished on him. And they must have been many because it went on for quite some time. He had so very many things to be thankful for. As we approach the Los Angeles area, uh, Mr. Armstrong on June 30th, Mr. Armstrong had some strange I, thoughts pop in his head. He said, I, I didn't tell the others what they were. I didn't want to cause them any concern, worry, or lack of faith. This I had to fight, uh, to fight out within my own mind by prayer and mental concentration. Finally, it seemed that I would win, uh, that I won a victory over these thoughts, and I had gotten my mind again into a state of faith. When they drove to UCLA Medical Center parking lot, we left the others in the car while Lois and I went to see Dick or to get a report on his condition. As we approached the entrance, Mr. Smith and our two nurses approached us with the news that just before they could get the artificial kidney connected, Dick had died. Richard David Armstrong would be Mr. Armstrong's oldest son, very, very involved in the work, helping Mr. Armstrong establish overseas or a, um, uh, different offices as the God continued to expand the work. It was a terrible blow to Mr. and Mrs. Armstrong as it would be to any family. But yet, Mr. Armstrong continued. There was a greater work that God had for him to do. That work of the Philadelphia area, era 
of preaching the gospel to the world. The thing is, brethren, when Dick was dying, and I'm sure he knew that he was, he thanked God many, many, many times for the wonderful blessings. When we think we've got it tough, we're going through trials, going through different things, maybe we can remember a story like this of an individual who was so thankful. Even though his life would end, he was so thankful to have that life and to be able to do what he could do and to thank God for those tremendous blessings. Brethren, I hope that... Um, I want to go to 1 John. I got two scriptures here I want to finish up with. I want to go to 1 John. 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, starting verse 1. But behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are the children of God and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has thus hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure, just as Christ is pure. In Daniel, Daniel, the last scripture. I'm going to go to Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as not was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to ask everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament. How shall we be, brethren? Those that are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament. And those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. That is our hope. That, brethren, is where we want to be. That should be our goal. That should be our desire. We want to be there. We want to be, we want to have that brightness, brethren. We want to be like the stars forever and ever. You know, sometimes I know life, life's issues can get us down. But we need to stay positive and we need to understand, brethren, we need to have a thankful heart. Thankful heart recognizes the blessings of God. A thankful heart is full of selflessness, always wanting to serve, always wanting to help others. A thankful heart endures those hard trials that make us better as a person. And hopefully as a God being that we will be able to, to be counted worthy of being in God's kingdom. And a thankful heart has hope. Thankful heart has many other things also. But those are the four things that I wanted to talk about today. And I hope, brethren, that we will recognize and that we'll be positive, that we'll always be thankful for all that God has done for us. For more information, go to our website at cogassembly.org. Copyright 2022, Church of God Assembly, all rights reserved.